Welcome to Straight Scripture, No Sugar. This is a Bible series dedicated exclusively to the Word of God. Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy Word is truth. John 17, 17. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16. All of Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training so every man may be perfect and complete and equipped for every good work. So if you have the truth and you have it in its fullness, as 2 Timothy talks about there, then you have everything you need to be perfect and complete and to live a life that is in the will of God and to live a life that is moving in the correct direction. The world has millions of different directions. The world is all things to all people, and people wonder why there's so much confusion, so much dis disorder, so much strife, so much animosity, so much hatred, because everybody is basically going their own way. All things to all people, whatever works for you, and that's the reason there's so much trouble in the world, because there is one true way and that is God's way. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. So if we have the truth, we have the correct way. We have a way that is free from error, free from confusion, and free from misunderstanding. That's why here you're getting straight scripture, no sugar. Um, so today's topic is does God change his mind? Does God change his mind? Well, we hear always throughout scripture that God is absolute. The truth is absolute, right? It's pure. It is without uncertainty. It is without wavering. It is without contradiction, right? The truth is absolute. So, on a quick study of scripture, it may look in certain instances like God changes his mind. Well, if he changes his mind, how absolute is scripture and how true is truth? Can we make that claim according to the scripture? Well, yes, we absolutely can. And the fact of the matter is, God does not change his mind. But on a very cursory look at scripture, a very hurried and quick look at scripture, it may look like God changes his mind, but he does not change his mind. Okay, a couple verses here to start off. From Malachi 3, I am the Lord, I do not change. Malachi 3, 6. Here's Isaiah 26, 4, following that. Trust in the Lord forever, for in the Lord God you have an everlasting rock. Okay, God doesn't change and he's a rock. Okay, if he doesn't change and he's a rock and he is the truth and his son is the truth, then why on earth would he ever change his mind? And the reality is that he doesn't. He doesn't change his mind. Uh, Jesus also says in Matthew 7.24 on the Sermon on the Mount, anybody who hears these things and does them will be likened to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the winds came and the storms blew, and the house stood. Okay? So Jesus says what comes out of his mouth is the truth and it is a rock. So he's consistent with the Father's character. John 10.30, I and the Father are one. So that same absolute truth, that same unwavering, unchanging truth is not only reflective of the Father, but also the Son, because Jesus is God on earth. He has the exact same character. Okay. So like, like I said, on quick look, it might look that God it might change his mind if you take a quick glance at Scripture without really understanding the depth of what's going on. So I'm going to look at four instances where it may look like God changes his mind when in fact he really doesn't. And I'm going to examine these uh, situations through four people. Okay, the first one is going to be Abraham, and then I'm going to talk about King Hezekiah, who was a king in the divided kingdom of Judah in the 8th century BC. Then I'm going to talk about uh, Moses and how he defended his people in the wilderness. And finally, the prophet Jonah, who was a prophet in the northern kingdom in the 8th century BC. Okay, so first I'm starting with Abraham. Okay, so... <clears throat> 
What's going on with Abraham? Well, Abraham was basically the father of promise. God said, I'm going to make a great nation through you, and I'm going to make your descendants as vast as the stars and the sand in the sea. And through you, nation upon nation upon nation and generation upon generation will be blessed, okay? So Abraham is the father of the Hebrew nation. He is the father of this great nation that God promises to deliver through him, okay? So let's go to Genesis 17 here. Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his descendants after him. Okay? Everlasting covenant, this everlasting covenant of the Hebrew nation, this promise of the Hebrew nation, is going to be delivered through his son Isaac. Okay? Isaac is the son of promise. This nation is going to come through Isaac. God promises that. Okay? <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to back up a couple chapters here to Genesis 15. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Genesis 15, verses 5 to 6, okay? Your descendants are going to be as vast as the stars, okay? And Abraham believes God. He says, yep, I believe you. And God credits him, uh, basically credits him as righteous because he believes God. Your descendants are going to be as vast as the stars, right? And then when I started with Genesis 17, your descendants are going to come through Isaac, through Isaac, your son, who is going to be born of your wife, Sarah. Okay? <clears throat> so Abraham says he believes God and it's credited to him as righteousness. He's going to be the father of this great nation, and this great nation is going to come through the promised son, Isaac. Okay? Now, God provides Abraham even more assurance. Okay? Abraham says, well, how will I know that this will be so? So I'm going to read uh, some verses here. Genesis 15, verses 8 to 21. <clears throat> okay, here's Abraham talking. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, this is God, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And when it came to pass, the sun went down, and it was dark, that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Okay. So there we have it. God makes a unilateral promise to Abram. Okay. He puts him to sleep. 
and he has him get these rams and has him get these goats and, and the animals for the sacrifice, the pigeon and the turtle dove. Okay, and then he cuts them in two, and then God himself puts Abram to sleep, and he goes through the sacrifices of the smoking furnace and a torch goes through. So this is a unilateral agreement. This is an absolute. This is something God is not going to change. He says to uh, Abram, you're going to be the father of this great nation, okay? This great nation is going to come through the loins of your son, who is going to be born by your wife Sarah. And by the way, here, I'm going to make a covenant with myself. I'll put you to sleep, and I'll send the torch, and I'll send the furnace through the sacrifices. This is basically God making a promise, a covenant, with himself. This is a unilateral, unilateral covenant. This does not depend on Abraham or Abram to be fulfilled. Okay, so what happens later on? Okay, listen to this. Here's where it looks like God may be changing his mind when in fact he is not. Alright, this is from Genesis 22. Then he said, God talking, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Genesis 22.2 Okay, before I get into an explanation, let's look at Abram's or Abraham's response. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Genesis 22, 3. All right, what's going on there? Okay, Isaac is the son of promise. This great nation is going to come through Isaac, okay? All the descendants of the earth are going to be blessed through Isaac. Oh, by the way, Abraham, kill your son. He is the son of promise. I'm going to make this great nation through him. Oh, kill him. What's going on there? It looks like God is completely changing his mind. It looks like a 180 degree turn in God's direction, right? It looks like he's changing his mind to the polar opposite of what he said to Abraham, right? But is that really the case? Okay, so let's look at Abraham's response. This is in a... Genesis 22.3. How does he respond? Does he say, wait a minute, God. You said Isaac was the son of promise. You said this great nation was going to come through Isaac. You said all the nations of the world are going to be blessed through Isaac. Now you want me to kill him? What's going on? How could, how could you do that? You don't change your mind. I mean, forget about the pain and the suffering of this son that Abraham loved. That's, that's really another point, but, you know, why doesn't he say, hey, you can't change your mind, you're God, you don't lie. Abraham basically gets the wood for his sacrifice, he gets his son, he gets two servants, and he just goes off to this land of Moriah where he's supposed to sacrifice the son. Okay, there's absolutely no argument from Abraham at all. No argument at all. Okay, well, let's go on and see what's happening here. Okay. Now, when they're on their way to Moriah, Abraham is basically taking his son, quote-unquote, to be sacrificed. It's a three days journey, and all along this journey, you never hear Abraham debating with God. You never hear Abraham saying, you, you can't change your mind like that. What, what are you doing? And in fact, Isaac asks Abraham, his father, what are we going to use for a sacrifice? This is from Genesis 22.8. Abraham, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Genesis 22, 8. Okay, Abraham said, God's going to provide the lamb. God's going to provide the sacrifice. Okay, so this goes back to earlier in Genesis 15, where it said, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Um, it's actually Genesis 15, 6. Okay? He believes God. He believes that the son of promise is Isaac. He believes that this great nation is going to come through Isaac. And that's why there's absolutely no debate when he says, sacrifice your son to me. 
he believes Isaac is going to be this son of promise, and he believes that God is going to provide the sacrifice. God is going to provide the sacrifice. Okay, so what happens when it actually gets to the point where Abraham is going to sacrifice his son Isaac? What happens? This is later in Genesis 22. And he said, this is God speaking again, or actually it's the angel of the Lord speaking, Do not lay your hand on the lad, on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Genesis 22, verses 12 to 13. There we go. There we go. Okay? Now, Abraham knew that a sacrifice would be provided. Okay, it wasn't technically a lamb, it was a ram caught in the thicket. But nevertheless, Abraham knew that God was not going to make him sacrifice his son. He would provide the sacrifice. And he knew that from the start. When God said, go sacrifice your son to me, your only son that you love. I mean, it sounds like he's really rubbing it in, right? Okay? And Abraham does not debate. He gets the supplies, he gets his son, he gets his wood, he gets everything needed for the sacrifice, he makes the three-day journey to Mount Moriah, he's getting ready to actually plunge the knife in, so to speak, and the angel of the Lord stops him, provides the ram in the thicket. Okay, so did God change his mind there? No, no. Isaac was the son of promise. Abraham believed him. It was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God all the way and understood that this was a test of faith. This was a test of faith. The angel of the Lord says, I know that you fear me because you have not uh, withheld your son, your only son. Okay, and God says earlier, your son, your only son, who you love, sacrifice him to me. Okay, so this is a test of Abraham's faith, and he passes the test. He goes through all the motions. He obeys God completely. He goes on a three days journey. He gets all the supplies. He gets the servants. He has the wood. He has the fire. He has the knife for the sacrifice. Right? No complaint. No equivocation. No doubt, he just goes through with it all the way. And it was a test of Abraham's faith to see if he loved God more than he loved his son. And he believed whether or not God would carry out his promise to, to make Isaac the son of promise. And he did. So Abraham passed the test. God did not change his mind at all. Okay? He did not change his mind at all. He upheld his unilateral covenant that this great nation is going to come through you and your son Isaac and that's exactly what happened this was a test of faith and Abraham passed the test of faith okay so I'm going to look at another another example of where it may look like God changes his mind when in fact he doesn't and this is through King Hezekiah okay so Hezekiah was a king in the southern kingdom of Judah in the 8th century BC. He was a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah. And he was one of the few good kings of the southern kingdom. He basically eradicated um, the worship in the high places. There was all sorts of sin and wickedness and idolatry going on at the time. And Hezekiah tore down the places of worship for the false gods. He was a faithful, loyal king to God. Okay, now I'm going to read uh, Isaiah 38, Trouble is Coming His Way. And let's see how Hezekiah responds to this. <clears throat> okay, Isaiah 38. Okay, Hezekiah, here we go. I'm going to read uh, Isaiah 38, verses 1 to 3. In those days Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, 
for you shall die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Hezekiah wept bitterly. Okay. God says, you're going to die, Hezekiah. Get your house in order. Okay, you're going to die. Get your house in order. Get your affairs in order. Uh, affairs in order. And he says, wait a minute. I've been loyal to you. I've been faithful to you. I've walked towards you in truth. Okay, I have been a true servant to you. He's weeping bitterly. Okay, this is a sincere prayer. There's absolutely nothing phony or fabricated about this prayer. This is coming from Hezekiah's heart. I've been faithful to you. I've been truthful to you. I've been loyal to you. He's staring at the wall, weeping bitterly. This is anguish of the heart. This is a sincere prayer. Now, we know that God answers sincere prayers, do we not? James 5.16, right? The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Well, Hezekiah meets all those qualifications right here, okay? This is a fervent prayer of a righteous man, okay? Let's see how God responds. Okay, this is in Isaiah 38, verses 4 to 5. And the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, Go and tell Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, Surely I will add to your days fifteen years. Isaiah 38, verses 4 to 5. Okay, that looks like God changes his mind, right? You're going to die in the opening verses. Hezekiah states his case. He weeps bitterly. He confesses his loyalty and how he's walked toward God in faith and truth. Okay, now God comes back to him right, right you know, momentarily after that and says, Oh, by the way, I'm going to add 15 years to your life. I have seen your tears. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. I'm going to add 15 years to your life. Now that looks like God changes his mind. You're going to die? No, you're going to live 15 more years. So what's going on there? What is going on there? It doesn't seem to make any sense at all. Well, this is a conditional promise. This is a conditional promise. Once again, this is a test of faith. This is a test of faith for the king of Judah. A conditional promise. A conditional promise. So God didn't state the whole thing. He said, Hezekiah, you're going to die. But the party left out, which is, you're going to die unless you plead your case to me, in which case I will add 15 years to your life. He didn't leave, uh, he didn't tell the second half of it to him. It's a conditional promise. It was to test Hezekiah's faith. And Hezekiah comes through. Hezekiah comes through. He states his case. He states how he has been loyal and faithful to God and walked in according to his ways in truth. Okay? Now, God doesn't need to know if Hezekiah's faith is sincere. He knows it. 1 Samuel 16, 7. Man sees the outward appearance. God sees the heart. So God knows that his heart is faithful. This is an exercise so Hezekiah will know how strong his faith is. This is so Hezekiah will know how strong his faith is. And why does he need to know that? Well, he's the king of Judah. You know, the king needs to have supreme faith. He is the leader of the people. So his faith needs to be supremely strong to set the right example for the nation. And this is a test for Hezekiah. Are you going to state your case? Are you going to talk about how faithful you are and how you've walked toward me in truth? Are you going to? He did. He passed the test. God gave him 15 more years of life. And on top of that, Hezekiah also wanted confirmation that this was going to come to pass, just like Abraham did. Abraham wanted confirmation that this covenant was going to come to pass. So God made the universal covenant 
um, by having the uh, torch and the smoking furnace going through the sacrifices. Okay, here, and I'm not going to get into it, but basically Hezekiah wanted some proof that he was going to have 15 more years of life. And he says to uh, um, Isaiah, tell God to have the sundial move back 10 degrees. And that's exactly what happened. The sundial went back 10 degrees. So God even gave him a sign that he was going to get 15 years of more life. So basically, he wanted more confirmation. God gave it to him. God gave it to him. Okay. So that was a conditional promise, another test of faith. And Hezekiah passed. Okay. <clears throat> Example number three, Moses. Okay, this is another instance where it may look like um, God changes his mind, but he does not. Okay, with Moses, what was going on here is he basically led the Hebrew nation out of captivity. They're in the wilderness, and they are rebelling abjectly. They're involved basically in idol worship. They're worshiping the golden calf and a drunken orgy when Mo Moses is up on Mount Sinai getting the law, okay? So basically what happens in the wake of that? Okay, here's God talking to Moses in Exodus 32. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and I will make of you a great nation. Exodus 32, verses 9 to 10. There we go. All right? My anger is going to burn against these people. They're stiff-necked. They're rebellious. I'm going to wipe them out, and I'm going to start over with you. I'm going to start over with you, Moses. I'm going to make this great nation out of you. But you notice key, two key words in there. May. He says may twice. What does he say? Let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. Okay? May. That's not an absolute. I may consume them. Okay? It's like you're saying, I may go for a walk this afternoon. Well, are you going to go for that walk or not go for that walk? You might. You might not. Okay? Basically, no promise has been made here at all. This is God saying, this may happen, it may not happen. Okay, let's look at the response of Moses. This is just a few verses later in Exodus 32. Why should the Egyptian speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by that I have spoken. Oh, wait a minute. To whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm, which he said he would do to his people. Exodus 32, verses 12 to 14. There we go. Moses, Moses is basically acting as a defense attorney for the Hebrew nation. Okay? He's defending them. He's defending them in spite of their abject sin, in spite of their idolatry, in spite of their drunken orgy. He's defending them. He's defending them. And what is he saying? He's saying, look, don't destroy your people. Then the Egyptians are going to say that you just took them out in the wilderness to kill them. Okay? That's going to destroy your name and reputation, God. Do you not have the power to deliver your people? Do you not have the power to fulfill a promise that you said you were going to release your people and take them into this great nation? You know, how are people going to think of your name and reputation if you can't fulfill what you say you're going to do? Then he also, that's point number one. Point number two is, he says to God, look, these are your promised people who came through Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Okay? You promised to make a nation through Abraham. 
through Isaac, through Israel. Okay, and you were going to make their descendants as vast as the stars in the sky. He's basically repeating the Abrahamic covenant that God said to Abram and Abraham way back in Genesis, right? He's repeating it. He's repeating it, okay? Then what happens? God relents. He relents from the harm which he said he would do to his people. He doesn't wipe them out. He doesn't wipe them out, okay? He doesn't wipe them out. This was another test. This is a test for Moses, okay? So like Abraham, who was basically the father of promise, he needs to be tested. His faith, faith needs to be supremely strong. That's why he puts him through the test with Isaac. Hezekiah, he is a king, a leader of the nation. He needs to have supreme faith because he is a leader of the people of Judah. So he cannot have wavering faith. His faith needs to be strong. So God tests his faith to see if he will state his case and be granted more life. Hezekiah passes. Okay, now Moses also passes the test. He calls on God's character. Okay, he says, look, you're a God of truth. You're a God of deliverance. You're a God who says you're going to lead your people out into the promised land. Now you can't kill them in the wilderness. By the way, you can't kill this nation either because you made this unilateral promise with Abraham that this great nation was going to come through uh, these, these great uh, patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Right? All that's 100% true. All that's 100% true. So God doesn't destroy the Hebrew nation in the wilderness. He doesn't destroy them. Now there was some punishment that happened and there were people who died um, to basically set the proper example. But he doesn't wipe out the nation. He doesn't wipe out the nation. This is another character test. A character test for Moses to see if he will defend his people and to see how strong his faith is. Not in the Hebrew nation, but in God. You made this promise, you said you were going to deliver, your reputation and your name are at stake with the pagan nations, you got to come through. You made this promise that this great nation was going to come through Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, you've got to come through, and he does, and he does. Great test of faith, but God does not change his mind here. He said, my anger may burn against them, and I may start over with you. Okay, this was another test of faith, a test of faith in the character of Moses because he was the leader of the Hebrew nation at the time. Okay, one final example, Jonah. One final example is Jonah. Okay, now let's see what happens here. So Jonah was a prophet in the northern kingdom in the 8th century BC and God said, I want you to go to preach out against Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital, capital of Assyria. The Assyrians were brutal butchers who murdered people and were just abject, wicked, wicked pagans who basically had no mercy, no compassion. They were marauders and they were incredibly, incredibly destructive, butchering murderers, okay? So here's what God says <clears throat> to Jonah. He wants Jonah to go into Nineveh, into that city, and preach against the Assyrians. What does he tell Jonah? Okay, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Imitai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. Their wickedness has come up against me. Go out and cry out against this city, all right? Okay, so what does God want Jonah to say when he cries out? Okay, let's go to chapter 3 of Jonah. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jonah chapter 3, verse 4. Okay? Forty days, this city's going to be wiped out. That's what God told Jonah to say. He cries out against it. Okay? This is a severe threat. That You know, the whole city's going to be destroyed. Okay? It's going to be overthrown in forty days. Okay, let's see how the Ninevites respond. So I'm going to read Jonah chapter 3, verses 5 to 10.
Okay, here's the response from Nineveh. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. He did not do it. So does God change his mind there? No, nope. it's another conditional promise. Okay, in 40 days, Nineveh is going to be overthrown. In 40 days, Nineveh is going to be overthrown, but... He didn't mention the, the back side of it. In 40 days, Nineveh is going to be overthrown unless they repent and turn from their wicked ways, right? But he didn't tell Jonah to say that. He just said, in 40 days, this city is going to be overthrown. Then what happens? The whole nation repents, okay? The king sets out, sends out this communication that basically says, look, let's turn from our wicked ways. They're all in sackcloth. Right? Even the animals are in sackcloth. We must turn from our wicked ways. We must turn from the violence that is in our hearts. Okay, everybody in the nation gets this decree from the king. And what happens? They all repent. They do turn from their wicked ways. They do turn from the violence in their hearts. And then God sees that they do it. He sees that they do it. All right? So what happens? He relents, and he does not destroy the city. He does not destroy the city. All right? So he sees that they truly do repent. And this took place over 40 days. So it's not like they said, oh, one day I'll turn from the violence in my heart, and the other 39 days I'll just go back to the way that I was. No. They truly repented. They truly feared God. And they repented, and they turned from their wicked ways. And then God said, all right. I'm not going to destroy this city. This is truly a repentant city. And it was also basically an object lesson to the northern kingdom. God was going to show, look, I'll save an entire city of wicked, abject pagans, and you will continue, you, the sons of promise in Israel, you will continue in your rebellion and sin against me. But I can show you how an abjectly pagan nation will repent. It was basically intended to be a re rebuke against Israel in the northern kingdom, which was also caught up in abject wickedness and idolatry and murder. Nevertheless, okay, it looks like, once again, God may be in a position where he changes his mind here, but he does not change his mind. This was a test for the Assyrians, okay? This was the test for the citizens of Nineveh, okay? If I promise to destroy you, in 40 days, are you going to repent? They did repent. They did repent. This is another conditional promise, okay? I'm going to overthrow this city unless you repent. He left the back side of it out. But they did repent, okay? So God didn't destroy the city. It was a test to see if these citizens of Nineveh truly feared God. And they did. They passed the test, okay? They passed the test. And they proved that they feared God, just like all the other examples here, right? Just like the other examples, just like Abraham feared God, just like Hezekiah feared God, just like Moses feared God in showing that God had to be faithful to his promises and to his truths, 
Okay, so basically what I've shown here is God does not change his mind. What he does is he tests faith. He tests character. And it looks like he changes his mind at a very, very superficial glance. But when you look deeper into it, you realize he doesn't change his mind. He makes some promises that are conditional. He makes some promises that are unconditional. With Hezekiah, okay, it's a conditional promise. With the Ninevites, it's a conditional promise. And he doesn't reveal the backside of that promise. However, does he have to? No, God's sovereign. The secret things of the Lord are, hit, are hidden, Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. So he doesn't have to tell us every single aspect of what he says he's going to do. But these were tests of faith. These were tests of faith. And they were passed by the people who were asked to pass the tests. And on deeper look, we see that God makes some conditional promises, some unconditional promises. With Abraham, it was an unconditional promise and a test of faith. And with Moses, actually, it wasn't a promise that no promise was made at all. He says, my anger may burn against them. My anger may burn against them. I may destroy them and start over with you and create this new nation. Okay? No promise was made there at all. So it's very, very important to plumb the depths of Scripture to make sure you see what's going on and you have insight into the fullness of God's revelation. Because on a quick look, it can look like superficially God changes his mind but he doesn't. He does not change his mind. Malachi 3.6 I am the Lord. I do not change. So I just want to finish with a quick gospel sermon. Uh, essentially all have sinned and all fall short of God's glory. There is not one righteous, not one, not one who understands or seeks after God. That's Romans 3.10. The previous verse was Romans 3.23. So we're all guilty of sin. Okay, We all rebel against God. We all basically um, are against him from the start. There's not one righteous, not one. If you've ever lusted, you've ever lied, cheated, stolen, you've ever lusted after somebody else's wife, car, house, anything like that, and we're all guilty of it, we're all guilty of sin. There's not one righteous, not one. But God sent Jesus Christ, the righteous, to pay the penalty for our sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made the man who knew no sin to become sin for us, so in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus himself pays the penalty for sin. He pays the penalty for sin on the cross. God crushes him on the cross as a substitutionary payment for the sins of believing humanity before and after the cross. In so doing, he reconciles us to himself. Okay, the man who knew no sin. He is Jesus. He becomes sin for us. So in him, we become righteous in God's eyes. That's what makes us righteous in God's eyes. His son, the man who knew no sin. So if we confess Jesus as Lord, Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. So Jesus is the atonement. He is the substitute. He is the sacrifice that satisfies God's wrath against sin. So when he sees a believer who has confessed Christ, he does not see a sinner. He sees his perfect son, the man who knew no sin. And if you confess Jesus as Lord, God will see his son when he looks at you and you will be saved and have the opportunity for a sanctified and productive and useful life for his glory in this world in time and space. <clears throat> so this series is called Straight Scripture No Sugar. There are many other uh, sermons that explore topical issues through the lens of Scripture and basically character issues through the lens of Scripture. There are many other sermons on this site. It's at Get Bible Truth. You can watch them at any time. And I say thank you so much for listening. My name is John Parisi. God bless you. Amen.